Do you need to find a skeleton? How would you tell people that design? You personally, how would you tell that design? Well, interesting question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm research on this. Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. I found out a few days ago as of writing this that Jungle Jargon had made two videos about me. Turns out, it was really only one as he had technical difficulties with the first one, although he hasn't bothered to take it down. Anyway, I figured that since Jungle Jargon was so nice as to make a video about me, that I'd return the favor and respond to it. So let's watch, shall we? So I woke up this morning, and I was thinking about the discussion that we had, and I played some of the discussion too that G-Man and I had with uh, Dapper Dino. So a few times here, it seems like Jungle Jargon goes back and forth between a discussion we both had on GTV, one of G-Man's channels, and one we had on his channel that was originally supposed to be about linguistics, but instead just became about the human Y chromosome. To be fair to him, I've sort of merged them in my mind too, so I don't really fault him. And it's really curious that they want us to believe things without backing it up or proving it. Because they say you can't know anything for certain in science. Well, the only things I advocate for as Dapper Dinosaur is that you believe things that are well backed up. But well backed up and proven aren't the same thing. Proven means there is not even a logical possibility that one is wrong. You can do that in mathematics, but not in science, as there is always a margin of error. But eventually, when so many observations, experiments, and measurements all support a single theory, it becomes so likely to be true that to act as if it were not true becomes a bit crazy. Evolution, universal gravitation, quantum dynamics, and the germ theory of disease are all examples of this. But they want us to believe anything they say is true anyway. I mean, not anything, but the basics of science would be a good thing for everyone to start accepting. So, we have this problem in schools, in uh, colleges, in the media, where they want you to believe something that they have no basis for what they want you to believe. I'm not sure why Jungle Jargon here keeps beating around the bush. We all know he means basically all of modern science, since that's what would have to be overturned for young Earth creationism to be true. I'm thinking about it, given the fact that what we want him to believe is basically the last 200 years of scientific advancement, I can see why he would not want to come out and state that. Not wanting to share what they believe, I mean, not wanting to, you know, not even wanting to say what they believe, but then they want you to believe what they're telling you to believe. So I've stated honestly all of the things I advocate for publicly. The only thing I can think of that Jungle Dragon doesn't know about my beliefs is my religious affiliation or lack thereof. And that's because I don't advocate for or against any such position, provided it is compatible with science. Now, his version of Christianity is incompatible with science, but I don't think all of them are, evidenced by the fact that most Christians don't reject science, and many scientists are Christian. So if he's looking for me to say that I'm an atheist and I want him to stop believing in God, that's not going to happen, because I have no intention of discussing whether I'm an atheist, and I don't really have a dog in the fight as the Dapper Dino what anyone does with his belief in God. So we're having this discussion, G-Man and I, with Dapper Dino, and he couldn't back up anything he was trying to tell us to believe. If Jungle Dragon wants sources, I can give them, but I was there for a chat, not a formal academic discussion. And frankly, I was probably the person chatting the least, as it was really a discussion that had been initiated between Gutsa Gibbon and G-Man, and I was simply her guest and Jungle Dragon his. In fact, I don't even remember what I said, and don't care enough to go back to find out, because that stream was rather long, and while it didn't end with anger or harsh words, it also didn't end what you'd call well. You know, because he was saying, well, science, you can't know anything for sure, but you want me to believe it as if it was for sure. No, I want everyone to believe it with the confidence that the data indicate, which is to say, extremely high confidence. You don't need 100% confidence to believe something. For example, I think I'm writing this on a Monday. I'm almost never wrong about what day of the week it is, and I remember yesterday being Sunday. But I could be wrong. I have been in the past. So let's say I check the date on my computer. Well, that also says it's Monday. But the problem is computers can be wrong too. So even then, I don't know with 100% confidence that it's Monday. 
I could ask my friends and family, or even strangers, and each time one of them confirms that today is Monday, it raises my confidence, but it's not technically impossible that they could all be wrong. So after a few instances of everything confirming that it is Monday, and nothing or very little indicating otherwise, I simply accept that it is Monday and move on. That is also like how science works. Our confidence never gets to 100%, but at a certain point the evidence is so overwhelming, you no longer worry too much that the basic theory is wrong. It's like the Westminster Confession. It's not the Word of God, but they want you to believe it as if it is the Word of God. I have no idea what a Presbyterian Confession of Faith has to do with anything, or why Jungle Dragon brought it up, or what his objections to it are. Maybe he just doesn't like Scotland. So, same thing with evolution, no different. They, they want you to believe evolution is true without without having a basis for it. Except that's the exact opposite of what I want. The basis for evolution is about as solid as they come. So much so that the problem of providing a source to demonstrate that is more where to start rather than having trouble finding one. Essentially, every paper in genetics, taxonomy, paleontology, virology, etc. is adding to that confidence, as nearly all of them explicitly validate some prediction we can make from evolution. And until I'm shown otherwise, none of them falsify the theory or even come close. And then they'll attack our position. Our position is based on known human history. What Jungle Dragon means when he says known human history isn't the kind of thing you'd get if you took an ancient history class. I know, because I've done that. What he means is basically the first few chapters of Genesis. Unfortunately, we know those chapters are not literally historically true, and since they were likely written at a time when the concept of sober, unbiased historiography had not really developed, they weren't really intended to be either. They were the mythic history of the Hebrew people, written to help them maintain their cultural identity during a time of exile in their homeland, and based on how well modern Jews have done to maintain a distinctly Jewish identity, even though they are scattered around the world, I'd say it has done a great job of that for thousands of years. Essentially, Genesis might be the most successful book in history, if judged on the basis of how well it has done as a foundation story helping to create a distinct ethno-religious group. Archaeological facts which confirm our known human history of all the cities of ancient Mesopotamia. Yep, Genesis does record real locations, but that's to be expected. It was written to contextualize Hebrew identity in the real world of what was then the present. So of course it needed to reference real things, otherwise this origin story would not actually tell the Hebrews how they related to the various cultures around them and why they were different. And it's the only history that we have. Well, in point of fact, we have extensive history from the Sumerians and the Egyptians that goes back past the alleged time of Noah's flood some 4,400 years ago. In fact, the first dynasty of Sumer goes back as far as 4,600 years ago. And while the Sumerians had a flood story, which is almost certainly what the story of Noah was based on, the closest the Egyptians come to a flood story is a story about a god wanting to drown a few people in blood, but Sekhmet, the lion warrior goddess, prevents it. Plus, there is simply no possibility that there was ever a global flood anything like described in Genesis. If that had happened, it would not be a debatable topic. It would be glaringly obvious. They want us to believe their story that they have no archaeological evidence. Well, we wouldn't really expect much archaeological evidence for evolution, since archaeology is just looking at human artifacts. There is some, though, in that ancient stone tools increase in sophistication along with the brain case capacity of fossil hominins. But I will admit that paleoarchaeology is not exactly what is used as the primary evidence for human evolution. As for events like a global flood wiping out a pre-existing civilization, that would leave an archaeological record. As would everyone dispersing from the Tower of Babel from Mesopotamia. And that evidence is entirely lacking. Jungle Jargon seems to be under the impression that archaeology demonstrating that Genesis mentions real places is therefore proof positive that all of its claims are literally true. Unfortunately for him, that is not how historians or archaeologists do things. They have no scientific basis for believing in deep time evolution. I mean, except for, you know, deposition rates, radiometric clocks, genetic clocks, distant starlight, the CMB, and the fossil record. For the Earth to not be old, you would have to break the most fundamental aspects of physics. There is no realistic possibility that deep time is not real. And even if there was deep time, it wouldn't exist anyways. Because evolution never happens at any time. Every claim of evolution is always disproved. Um, got a source on that? I'm unaware of a single time that evolution has been disproved. And if it had been, it would largely be abandoned. I'd sure ditch it. I don't particularly like evolution, believe it or not. Every claim that they make... 
So they keep coming back with us, trying to force us to believe their belief, which they are ashamed to say is their belief. I am ashamed of exactly none of my beliefs. But some beliefs that are irrelevant to what I want to talk about, I won't share with you. Just like you don't get to know my relationship status with a significant other, you don't get to know my religious stance, or stances, or lack thereof. It's neither relevant nor anyone's business. The only things I believe that I advocate others believe, I'm very open about. Which is what Dapper Dino was doing. He wants us to believe in evolution, but he's ashamed to say that that's what his belief is. I am not ashamed. Evolution is the only theory of biodiversity and the history of life that has any shred of evidence for it. To deny it requires ignorance, dishonesty, or both. Or maybe insanity. I have no shame about this. I'm also not ashamed about the things I don't tell jungle jargon about. He is just not my personal friend, so he doesn't get to know them. It's really weird. No, what's really weird is your inability to separate your conception of my alleged atheism from the claims about science I make. So he's afraid to show what he believes. And he was trying to say that the, uh, the, um, the charts here or the family trees, he's trying to say that these family trees are not rooted, such as this one here. When I first saw this, I laughed for a solid three minutes in a row. The arrogance and confidence with which Jungle Dragon dismisses the criticism that a phylogeny he likes isn't rooted is just so amazingly hilarious when he then brings up an unrooted tree. In fact, the label on this figure, which is figure 3 in the creationist paper An Overview of the Independent Histories of the Human Y Chromosome and Human Mitochondrial Chromosome from the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism by Robert W. Carter, published in 2018, labels this diagram as an unrooted neighbor-joining phylogenetic tree of the Y chromosomes from the Simmons Genome Diversity Project. Even the creationists know this is an unrooted tree. So let's look at a couple phylogenetic trees. First, this tree is unrooted. Each tip represents an actual extant group, or in some cases, perhaps even a person. There is no way to tell which group split off from any other group, because without a root representing the common ancestor, there is no way to establish directionality. Now let's look at a rooted tree. This tree is giving us essentially the same information as the previous one, but it has an unlabeled line going up, where all the other tips are going down. This represents the root of the tree, the common ancestor. This would be the Y chromosome atom, since this is a Y chromosome haplotype phylogeny. This is literally the kind of thing you learn in the first 10 pages of a decent phylogeny textbook. In order to get this wrong, you have to have done not even the most basic research on phylogeny. Now it's fine to not know that stuff, unless you're going to try to make arguments about it. Try to say it's not rooted. Well, it is rooted. It's rooted in Noah. Even if Noah were the common ancestor of all of us, making him Y chromosome atom, that tree would still be unrooted because that's how it was built. All those branches are extant groups, and there is no root for a common ancestor, and you couldn't even add one. It would be like trying to add a grid to a pie chart. That's just not how phylogeny works. Jungle Jargon would like for the root to be here, and he thinks that including the E3B haplogroup would show that that's where the root is, but nowhere that you could put the E3B group would actually show you where the root should be. In fact, pretty much every phylogeny that tries to use the actual data puts the root here. And that's the only place you can root it. You can't root it in an animal that has a completely different Y chromosome than us. In a chart of Homo sapiens Y chromosome, no one would try to include non-humans. The subject of the chart is humans. If you want to make a chart of, say, hominoid Y chromosome diversity, you can actually do that using the same techniques to compare human Y chromosomes. In fact, it has been done, and the outcome matches with all the other evidence, putting orangutans as the outgroup of the rest of the hominoids, then gorillas as the outgroup relative to Homo and Pan, and then genus Pan, the chimps, as being the closest relatives of humans that are extant. Which is the chimp, which they keep trying to say. They keep trying to root our tree in a chimp's tree, and there's no family resemblance. <laughs> there's no family connection. No, the root of the human Y chromosome family tree would be a human, whether it's Noah or not. And he wouldn't be the first human, or some missing link. If you saw this man, he would almost certainly have looked like a normal African man, because, except for a quirk of statistics, that's all he was. As for the similarity of chimp and human Y chromosomes, they are in fact quite structurally similar, and more similar to each other than they are to gorilla Y chromosomes, 
and human gorilla and chimp Y chromosomes are again more similar to each other than any of them are to orangutans. In fact, this chart is showing some of the similarities. And you have this huge gap here between these trees here, because these are trees. This is a tree, this is a tree, this is a tree. They're all stemmed from the same source. That's where it's rooted in Noah. Well, it certainly could be rooted there, but it's not. And it's not even the biggest gap on the tree. It's just a biggish one towards the middle. But the middle isn't the root of the tree. In fact, when scientists actually go about trying to figure out where the root is, they invariably end up rooting it between A and B. In the description, you'll find three different papers that all root the phylogeny in the same place for the same reason, because they traced back the mutations and arrived at that conclusion. To see how this works, I'll compare it to the Bible, specifically ancient manuscripts of the Bible. You see, we put biblical manuscripts of sufficient size into textual families. The two major families, at least for the Greek New Testament, are Alexandrian and Byzantine. So these manuscripts were produced by hand copying, which comes with errors. These errors were most often either innocent mistakes, or things like using an abbreviation in the new text where the older text did not include that. An example might be replacing the word for God, theos, with a theta with a swoop over it, which is a common abbreviation, or another would be that since many words in Greek end up ending in the same two or three letters, a scribe might accidentally skip down a line to another word with a similar ending. But when this new script is used for copying, those errors are likely to be carried down to the next generation of manuscripts, which themselves may contain new errors. So by seeing which errors, in this case analogous to mutations, are in which manuscripts, we can build a family tree of biblical manuscripts. In the same way, by tracing shared mutations, in the same way, by tracing shared mutations, we can build up the history of the Y chromosome and depict it as a phylogeny. And when this is done, we always get the same tree. If Jungle Dragon wants to say that everyone got it wrong, he's going to have to actually get the data and run his own phylogenetic analysis and then defend it. Simply getting the Phoenicians and Berbers mixed up and then asserting that the tree is rooted elsewhere and basing it on the Bible is not sufficient. And these are known people groups. And uh, you can't deny if you're an S, you can't claim to be a Q. If you're a Q, you can't claim to be an A. I can claim whatever the heck I want. The question is, am I right? And if you're an A, your tree branched off from the same place that the CY chromosome branched off from. There's a node there, but without a root, we can't tell in what direction the branching took place. So we can't say that C and A branched off at the same time from a common ancestor that they did not share with, say, G. You literally cannot gain that information from an unrooted tree. And calling it unrooted doesn't mean no root exists. It means the diagram is not equipped to show you where it is. CY chromosome is just as old as the A. I mean, kind of? All Y chromosomes are about as old as each other in terms of generations from Y chromosome Adam, but every rooted tree results in A to B being the first split, so A is the most divergent of all human Y chromosomes. And if they had the 3B Y chromosome in here, if they had the chutzpah, or the courage or the willpower to put the E3B Y chromosome in here, it would be before the A and the C and the D. Well, it wouldn't go there, because when he says 3B, he means E3B. And while I don't actually know why it's not on this particular phylogeny, the reason it's an E is because it's closer to the other E's than any other group of Y chromosomes. So it would go somewhere in there. But even if it did, by some wild insanity, go where Jungle Dragon wants it to, that wouldn't make it the root of the tree, because again, that's an unrooted tree. You can put a nuclease anywhere on it, and it doesn't root the tree. Because I know for a fact that the C was the son of the E3Y chromosome, which is Cush. Of course, there's other E3s too, but they're Cush's brothers. The groups at the tips can't be ancestral to other groups. They are all extant groups so none of them can be the ancestor of one another. That doesn't make any sense. It's like saying your brother is your great-great-grandfather. Well, let's assume time travel shenanigans are excluded here. Even assuming that the early chapters of Genesis were actual literal history, it's not likely that the named figures would actually end up as the common ancestor of various extant groups. It's more likely it would be one of their unnamed descendants, simply because if any one of them came to be the sole descendant to leave direct male line and descendants, he'd become the common ancestor. Statistically, that's not unlikely. So even if what he was saying, he was saying that uh, 
Dapper Diner was trying to tell me that that the Berbers are not Phoenicians. He said, they're Canaanites. What difference does it make? So now he's going back to the discussion I had on his channel. His claim was that because all the E3 groups are related closely, they were all descended from four brothers, namely Canaan, Put, Mizraim, and Cush, who in the Bible are the descendants of Ham, except that the Phoenicians are known to have been in haplogroup J, not E, and you will see my source, again, in the description. This is as would be expected for a group of Semitic speakers originating in what is now Canaan. They colonized North Africa in the early Iron Age in the wake of the late Bronze Age collapse. The native people of the area in question are the Berbers, who are a semi-nomadic group who speak a non-Semitic Afro-Asiatic language. They are in haplogroup E, which includes most African Afro-Asiatic speakers in Africa, except for, again, the Semitic-speaking groups in areas like Eritrea and Ethiopia. So if you're basing this whole idea on the biblical idea that Canaan, who is the supposed ancestor of the Phoenicians, should be in the E3-B2 haplogroup, we know for a fact that he wasn't. Therefore, the biblical model Jungle Jargon has put forward is flatly falsified. And to get around this, he just pretends that the Berbers are the Phoenicians because, well, he doesn't know anything about history, genetics, or which cultures are which. The Can Canaan was the brother of Put, which is the brother of Mitzrayim, which is the brother of Cush. They're all brothers. They all have the same Y chromosome. Except, like I said, that map itself shows that all the groups we can identify with Canaan were in fact carriers of the J haplogroup, not E. According to the Bible, Canaan's descendants included the Sidonians, who were apparently the Phoenicians, the Hittites, who were an Indo-European speaking group in what is now Turkey, who probably did not have a dominant haplogroup being composed of people from a diverse background in reality as opposed to jungle jargon's fiction, the Jebusites, who were claimed almost certainly falsely to be the ancestors of the Arab Palestinians, but this was done for political reasons, not scientific reasons. But if it were true, that would also put the Jebusites in the J group, not in the E group, the Amorites of unknown Y haplogroup, but who, based on location and language, were probably also in J, and the Hamathites, Sinites, Semurites, Arvidites, Girgashites, Archites, and Hivites, about whom essentially nothing is known. So we have, according to Jungle Jargon, one brother with a J haplogroup Y chromosome, and three brothers with E chromosome haplogroups, even though his favorite unrooted phylogeny doesn't put those as particularly close, and there's no way to root the tree to make them sister groups. But to get around this, he proposes that an entirely unrelated group, the Berbers, are actually Phoenicians, as far as I can tell, solely because they have the right Y chromosome haplogroup. Another group that I'd like to talk about, regardless of what's going on with their chromosomes, is my patrons and channel members. I want to take a moment during this first month of a brand new year to thank my patrons and my channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above, Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, and Henry Hutanen. You guys really helped me get through the last year, and it was a rough one, and I cannot thank you enough. Now, if anyone here is listening and isn't supporting but would like to, there's a link to my Patreon down in the description, as well as the option to join the channel underneath this video. If those aren't right for you, there's also a Teespring store, and if none of that works for you, please just like and share this video, because that helps this channel grow, and that really helps out. Which is a different family tree than all the rest of the world. Right, which is the problem, because the people he thinks are Phoenicians aren't. And we did not branch off from the CY chromosome. You can see right here. CY chromosome branches off from the E3 family tree, the same place as the A1Y chromosome branched off from. See, Jungle Jargon cannot understand that none of these groups branched off from one another. They branched off from common ancestors. None of these groups is ancestral to one another. He cannot separate in his mind the idea of a root from a branch, even though they are essentially opposites. And we are who we are. And just because somebody's a CY chromosome doesn't mean they're, they're condemned for all eternity. Or it doesn't mean that they're a lizard people or, or whatever. It doesn't mean anybody's a lizard people or a condemned people for any reason. I have absolutely no clue why we're talking about lizard people. I'm not sure anyone is trying to claim that haplogroup C is a bunch of irredeemable lizard people. I don't even know what that means. It's certainly not my position. Because the CY chromosome is found over here in South America, the wild riding people, and the wild riding people receive the gospel. And they're homicide rate dropped from 60% down to near zero. 
So I tried to look into this and there are not a lot of sources, but what I can gather from admittedly iffy sources is that the Wayorani are currently about 20% Christian, and that since their initial contact with the outside world in the 1950s, they have engaged in much less conflict with other groups in the area, even intermarrying with formerly hostile ethnic groups. They are also losing land to oil exploitation and logging. To what degree these changes are directly tied to Christianity, as opposed to simply being integrated into the worldwide society of the modern world, I cannot say. Because of the gospel. And uh, missionaries are slammed and condemned for trying to change people's customs. I actually don't slam missionaries for trying to convince people of their ideas. I think people should be allowed to try to persuade others. But there are concerns when contacting previously uncontacted groups. One of the biggest ones is that these groups may be exposed to diseases to which they have no resistance. This was the reason for one of the biggest plagues we know of, the plague that wiped out most native North Americans before Europeans even bothered to settle on the mainland of North America. It was mostly smallpox brought by Europeans to South America that then spread like wildfire up into North America. But also, it may be that these groups do not want to be contacted, as is the case with the North Sentinelese, who attempt to kill anyone setting foot on their island. In this case, insisting that you be allowed to visit them to preach is about the same as saying that you should be able to break into someone's house to preach, and then get upset when they use force to expel you. But, provided these things are not issues, I'm okay with people trying to spread their ideas. I also don't think that changing customs is per se a bad thing. For example, the practice in some parts of Africa of killing albinos to use their body parts in rituals is a bad custom. Similarly, the custom in ancient Greece of sexually abusing boys, or the current similar custom in Afghanistan, are bad. They should be changed. And if that change has to come through force, I'm okay with that. I'm not a cultural relativist. Of course, the gospel is what gave us our Western civilization to begin with. Christianity is certainly one of the most important aspects of the history of Western civilization, but it's far from the only one. But then, exactly what parts of what ideology caused which part of what we now think of as Western civilization is complex and probably unresolvable to some extent. But it is curious that Christianity in other places like Southwest India or Ethiopia did not lead to cultures that greatly resemble Western civilization. But the, the atheists keep fighting and fighting, fighting reality. They want to go back to the time when they were just uh, murdering people, like in China, in Russia, because of atheism. They just slaughter millions of people. Well, since I'm not here because of atheism, but this is supposed to be a response to me, I'm not sure what the point here is. But yes, plenty of atheists have done bad things, as have plenty of religious people. Were the killings in communist countries in the 20th century the result of atheism? Maybe. They were done by explicitly atheistic regimes, but then again, the regimes were far more interested in their preferred economic and political system than in religion per se. So, maybe not. But when we look outside of the communists, we see that, generally speaking, atheists are underrepresented among criminals, so at least on a personal level, atheism is certainly not correlated with more violence. You ever see a video of uh, soldiers going up to peasants or something like that and just shooting them down for no reason? That's what, that's what you have with atheism. Well, no, I've seen videos of that happening for bad reasons, but not for no reason. But I'm aware of things like that primarily happening under two regimes, the Khmer Rouge and the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The former was atheistic, but the latter was not. While the latter wasn't officially religious, it certainly exploited the native Christianity to help motivate their people and soldiers, even giving out belt buckles proclaiming that God was with them. That's what atheism offers with no God, no responsibility. Nothing about atheism means you're free of responsibility. It just means you're responsible to other people and not to God. Of course, it's a lie. And everyone will be judged according to their deeds. Even if Christianity is true, it doesn't make atheism a lie. It makes it untrue. You can be honestly mistaken. But there's no better race. We're all the human race. There, we can agree, Jungle Jargon. We all came from this region right here in Mesopotamia, where they had the, the Tower of Babel, where they have the city of Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham was from. If Jungle Jargon wants to show this with Y chromosome data, he's going to have to find a way to root his tree where he thinks it's rooted. That means he's actually going to have to download the Y chromosome data and run the numbers and find out how it's possible to root it here and not here 
which is where everyone else roots it. Until then, he's just talking nonsense. He was Semitic, which means he was descended from Sem or Shem. That's why it's Semitic, is because he's descended from Shem, Sem. Except that the descendants of Canaan were mostly Semitic too. So again, just the basics of the data contradicts this biblical genealogy. And the Cushites are Cushites because they're descended from Cush. Or, Cush was named after the people specifically to make the story of their ancestry seem plausible. These are known, these are known people. These are known people. Nope. They are characters in a book that we have no reason to think actually existed. In human history. That's why you have to root it in Noah. You have to root all these genomes. The L has to be rooted in Eve because the three, <coughs> the three wives of the three sons of Noah are rooted in Eve. Why do they have to be rooted in Eve? There's no reason to think they couldn't have a more recent common female line ancestor, which would make that woman mitochondrial Eve. And then when you go to the paternal line, they're all rooted in Noah because the three sons of Noah belong to the same family tree of the paternal line of Noah. If that were true, there should be an unresolvable polytomy at some point in the tree. There isn't. Therefore, at no point is it reasonable to conclude that three sons of the same father gave rise to all extant Y chromosome diversity. For those who aren't into reading such charts, a polytomy is where a node directly leads to more than two branches. And if somebody wants to be a scientist, they have to study human history before they try to do science because this is what they do when they try to do science without studying first human history, known human history. Remember, when Jungle Dragon says known human history, he just means the Bible. And the problem is, the Bible isn't so much evidence as it's a text which, based on your interpretation, can make a prediction. The prediction Jungle Dragon makes is that humans come from Mesopotamia and then spread out to the rest of the world. Too bad for him that just like his rooted tree shows, Human genetic diversity outside of Africa is a subset of human diversity within Africa. This is what their uh, belief is. Their belief is that you have the A first, and out of the A came the B, the C, the D, and the E. No, that is not what it means. I hope Jungle Dragon is watching this because I want him to repeat something to himself ten times a day and every time he looks at a phylogenetic tree. The phrase I want him to repeat is, the tips of branches on a phylogeny did not descend from each other. They share common ancestors. So no, B did not come from A. A and the rest of the tree share a common ancestor that is Y chromosome Adam. B shares a more recent common ancestor with the rest of the tree besides A than it does with A, and so on. Again, this is day one of phylogenetics class and everything else. And then they're trying to say that Europeans and Asians came from the sea. Only because the sea is found in, in Asia. Which is not the same thing as one coming from the other. Jungle Dragon is trying to overturn the scientific consensus without even being able to read a basic rooted phylogeny. This isn't baby hour creationists. You're trying to engage in a complex scientific topic while having the understanding I might expect from an eight-year-old. You really need to get better at this. And no, it's not because of where they are found, it's because of shared derived genetic traits. That's how all phylogenies are built. And it turns out that E is the progenitor of the A, the B, the D, and the e C anyways. I've already covered it. That's mostly because no exon group is the actual ancestor of some other exon group. That's just impossible. That's why, that's why in this Simmons Genome Diversity Project Y Chromosome Phylogeny, there is no E3, because if it was here, it would show that the C, the D, the A, the B, and the rest of these E's came from the E3. Nope, because one, extant groups can't be the ancestors of other extant groups, and two, no matter where you put any new haplogroup in that tree, it doesn't tell us anything about how the tree is rooted because you literally cannot tell where the root is on an unrooted tree. That's the whole point of it. Because I know for a fact that this E3 Cushite is the father of this C. All the C's around the world are from Nimrod, who had a kingdom in the land of Shinar in Mesopotamia. No, he doesn't. Not only do we have no way to verify that Cush or Nimrod even existed, E3 can't be ancestral to J1, 
and the actual pattern of the tree precludes this kind of relationship between the carriers of these haplogroups. Just this map is enough to disprove all of this. And it can't be anybody else because Nimrod was the first king early on, the king of the whole world. And there was a house of Nimrod, just like there's a house of David. They found out with archaeology, they said, oh, there is a house of David. Yeah, just because there is some archaeological evidence that the much later figure of David may have been real doesn't mean anything for Nimrod. The Bible isn't a single work. Even if we could prove that everything about the books of Chronicles and Kings were 100% true, that wouldn't help the credibility of Genesis as a literal narrative in the least. Same thing with the house of Nimrod. There was a house of Nimrod. When Esau killed Nimrod, all of his kingdoms fell in this area. Except that's not what we see in the actual histories of Mesopotamia. Nothing like this occurred. And the, uh, the external biblical, I mean, the external records, not, not biblical sources, say that the house of Nimrod was subdued for a time. They don't. I actually looked pretty hard. There are no extra-biblical sources that can be reliably identified as pertaining to Nimrod. He then just goes into Bible stories about Nimrod and Esau that aren't really important or relevant, so I cut them out. Except that after he says this. That's the story. I don't know. Who knows? Exactly. He doesn't know. He just assumes Genesis is literally true. But these are real people. You know, the events surrounding the people could be subject to interpretation, you know, validation, etc., everything. Except that being open to validation is also being open to falsification. Hence, we don't get to just know that Genesis is an accurate history. We have to test it. And the literal interpretation of Genesis has been flatly contradicted. Even Zeus was probably a real person even though they deified him and turned him into a god, ancestor worship, you know. Why would you think that? He's a wise father god associated with the sky, a common trope in basically all Indo-European mythologies. After that, it's a lot more of the story of Nimrod and then Joseph. I'm not sure what this has to do with anything I ever talked about with jungle jargon, or at all, really. After that, he just tries to apply the family tree of Noah to other groups of people. I've already addressed that, so I don't think there's much point in doing a point by point on it. So with that, I'm done with this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to like, subscribe, hit the bell, and turn on all notifications. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur.